to Dragonfly and Damselfly recording. Um, John Van Gowler over here um, is, um, is your mate, is, uh, is one of your two key speakers for today. And John is the, uh, John and Dion next to him are our Dragonfly experts. Um, all that I'm doing is to try and pull all of this together. So I'm, I'm in lower font in this case. It's, uh, but uh, why are we recording? Well, it's um, we're recording uh, on a national scale, but we really want to keep this uh, keep the records local. All of the data that you collect, whether it's for butterflies or dragonflies or bumblebees, that all goes to the national recording scheme. But once they go to those recording schemes, sometimes those records can't be um, can't be uh, can't be accessed by the local organisation. So they don't know then what's actually happening. Mm -hmm. So what we're trying to do is to ensure that they go to CERC, Somerset Environmental Record Centre. There is another one in the next Vice County, which is Burk, which is the Bristol Records Centre. Um, but uh, but we want to retain a local local series of records here. Um, and the reason for doing that is that we want to build up a data stack of uh, bio-indicator species. And these, these mean that we, if we're recording something for, for this kind of purpose, that, that we want to perform these counts on a regular basis. On a regular basis and year after year means that you then monitor the changes that are happening. Um, <coughs> but we also, of course, as well as the regular schemes, we want to do some periodic assessments of other species, um, uh, some of the boring flies that happen. Oh, sorry, Mike. Um, but you know, some, some, some of the flies that, that, that are actually really good indicator species and some of the beetles as well. So things, um, all sorts of things that are happening. That are happening. Um, data stacks, really important because it helps the nature reserves around here um, learn much more about the, uh, know much more about how to manage the sites. And what they need is all of this information. And some really good people, um, uh, young staff in particular, who joined, the, uh, joined the, the various trusts, are starting to take all of this data in and producing a local report for West Hay Nature Reserve. Rebecca Hardwick is putting that, that report together. And we've got other, other people in the other organisations who are doing the same thing. RSPB and naturalism and, and for, for the Hawk and Owl Trust. So they want all of this data that lots of other groups <coughs> start collecting together and that then gives them a more healthy uh, and a better indication of what the health of the population is like and what they need to do. It's, uh, so that's a data stack, but why in this particular case of recording Odonata? I'd said I wasn't going to use technical words Odonata is the, is the name um, of, uh, that covers dragonflies and damselflies, and it's Greek for tooth, uh, related to tooth. Um, but John will probably mention, mention this in, in his talk. But dragonflies and damselflies. We're going to try and avoid the more, the, the more Latinized Greek, uh, Greek terminology. Inevitably, some of it will creep in, but we're really trying to trying to keep that common uh, everyday language. The juvenile stages are in the water for anything from one or in the case of the golden ring up to four or even five years. Um, and, um, and, the, and unlike some other insect juveniles, if the conditions deteriorate, they literally can't get up and walk off. So if the conditions are bad, they're stuck with it. So, so they do need a continuous supply of water and they need a continuous food supply. They can go into a slight diapause, a slight, slight hibernation. But the present is the presence of the adults that tells us whether the habitats are healthy enough to support them. Of course, the adults can fly in. So that, so in some cases, that's a little bit of a variable thing. But catching and identifying the nymphs 
thoughts is interesting, mm. significant, but it isn't a very reliable way of monitoring what the uh, what damselflies and dragonflies you've got in the area. We also they they've also got a great ability to escape. Um, particularly the dragonflies, they're, um, they're jet propelled, um, they're not kidding with that, they will shoot water out of their anus and zoom off to the other <laughs> side and you wouldn't, wouldn't even know they've gone. So actually, the finding, pulling out the, uh, the, the dragonfly, the nymphs, doesn't tell us much about the abundance of the species. So, and it also, of course, if the conditions deteriorate, doesn't mean they'll continue their life cycle. So really, this is why counting the adults is more is a better thing to do, and they are prettier and easier to identify. So, the recording scheme that we're going to be sending the data to is the British Dragonfly Society, hereafter the BDS, and their recording scheme requires that you visit a site three times a year sometime between May and September and use either transect or point counts which I'll cover on the next slide or a mixture of those two where it's where appropriate. We're aiming to record a little bit earlier than that and go a little bit later and uh, there's good reasons for doing that um, but, uh, but we also want to record monthly um, because that will then um, record the changes that are happening. Judging by the number of people we've got who are showing an interest in this, I think we're going to have enough people assuming that you're not all bored by the end of the day. Um, right. But uh, so the recording scheme, the methodology of it, a transect is defined as something that is two meters inland. So if you're walking along a walking along a, 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 a path or a street, <coughs> it's two meters. Um, you're looking looking two meters either side of you, by the way, um, which is very familiar to the butterfly surveyors in here. How many are butterfly surveyors? Okay. <laughs> so you're all familiar with the two meters, two and a half meters all round, and five meters ahead. Um, in this case, transect is defined as um, as five meters across water um, as well. Now, it's something that is different to the butterflies. We don't usually do a point uh, static count. We usually encourage them to walk slowly and count what we're seeing by walking. And you shouldn't really stop and count, despite the fact that sometimes we do. Um, but this is actually defined as a point count, which is where you stand somebody somewhere and you, you count for count what's there for 20 minutes. So, and that's quite logical when you get into the practicalities of doing these counts. The 20 minutes is quite good. So a mixture of those is going to be required on most sites. And that's perfectly acceptable um, with for the methodology for British Dragonfly Society. You can capture these insects. You can't capture butterflies. Despite the fact that nets are called butterfly nets, and I wish they'd change it. Um, but net, net capture is allowable with exceptions and those, those are listed up on here. The trouble with those exceptions is you don't know that you caught them until they're in, until they're in the net. Hey ho, that's what happens. So, the nice thing about it is they like it to be sunny, warm and calm, but unlike the butterfly, sorry to be constantly running a comparison here, they don't specify the time of day, um, but the conditions are pretty much, pretty much the same. <coughs> We've got a recording form that we run using Excel. Um, and Excel is by far the best way of doing this. Uh, uh, we've also narrowed the form, split the form down so that you can pump. Is my mouse pointer showing up on there? No, it's not. Right. Okay. So we've split the form up into uh, into damselflies and dragonflies. Probably got that the wrong way around. Um, but anyway, we split those up into uh, into these two. We list down the species only the species that you're going likely to see here. 
You then got space to put in other ones. If you enter a count into uh, into an area, it will um, it will go in. Um, and uh, the beauty of any of this of Excel is that um, it adds it all up for you, and uh, and then that cuts down the errors. If you happen to spot the odd species, photographic records are always valuable. And if you happen to spot this particular one, it became extinct. <laughs> and, uh, that one? Yeah. You're talking about 125 million years. So it has been 325 for the carbon a long, long, long while. But, when, um, when I first started recording. <laughs> yeah. Bill recorded it. It's uh, last time. But uh, so, so you can list down any species and put it in freehand or free entry in there. If you don't use Excel, we also have a printer friendly form in just plain black and white PDF that you can write. Take a photograph, send it to us, and we bump the data in for you. The fact that it's that it's all done on Excel means that at the end of the year, it's much easier for us to analyse all the data that's um, that's coming in from the various sources. We're trying to use the same format all the way through. So we've got a plan for this year, and uh, and that's really to focus on four sites around here um, and we're spreading the love a little bit and going there is one already running on on ham wall but we're looking to provide more support to there because we've got some people who are experienced at the ham wall site and know exactly what it's doing so we want to support that one but we want to create new transects and points um, on uh, on these on these other these uh, on these other sites, Chapwick Heath for Natural England and uh, and West Haymore for um, for Somerset Wildlife Trust, as well as following the route the tr the butterfly route that's already running for the Hall Canal Trust. Now, one thing that will come up when you see an SWT West Hay on there is you immediately going to might think. Gosh, I'm going to have to pay three quid every time I go go and do this. Um, parking charges were introduced there on the 8th of January. Volunteers can register with the uh, site manager and can park free of charge by registering their car on that site. So it is down to the <coughs> car that is that is registered. So don't register. Think you can register and turn up in a different car. Uh, because you will then need to, to pay the three pound charge. Okay, so four main sites that we're focusing on, um, but uh, but we want to work closely with other sites as well. Uh, Steart Marshes, one of the. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to refer to John, uh, John and Dio. Steart Marshes has been allocated a particular site. What's it called? What's the term? To the dragonflies. Yes, it, it, it's um, it's a dragonfly hotspot. <laughs> hotspot. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's the term they use for it. Now. So it's a, yeah, they so put, they put all their signs up there now mm. with all the species. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So W we 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 said when we met with WWT last year that um, that we would work closely with them and um, and uh, and we would provide we would provide support and training support. Um, for them, but we will also require training from them as well. Gordano Valley is an important site that's up um, up uh, uh, along the uh, just just as you lean towards the M5 from uh, looking over Clevedon. Honeygar Farm, really important site locally to here, um, and we are hoping that um, that some of the volunteers there will pick up and run a butterfly Where is that site. Thing? It's in West Hay. It's down over, down, down here, um, down the road here. Um, last, last village as you, the last farm as you head out between West Hay and Burtle. Um, important site because it was bought by the uh, by the Wildlife Trust as a model for how farmers would tap into uh, to credits to carbon credits. Um, so we do want to know a lot about what's going on on that on that site. 
Watercrest Farm is a rewilding site, it's a true rewilding site, very exciting project. Um, that's up near to Tensfield House. Um, and very kindly, all of their volunteers there have been um, started doing recording last year. Um, so they ran through and gave us a bit of a test of how things would go. And of course, we'll then support anybody else who really wants, wants, uh, wants some. So, uh, there we go. Yeah. Uh, right, I should have... This is getting into a bit of detail. This isn't really, necess isn't really necessary at this stage. Today is an introduction day. Next session is much more about identification. And these are not coming up on screen in the right order, and I meant to chop it around. But, uh, but I think you can generally get from that slide that not all species occur at the same time. And where some of them start to emerge in March um, and, uh, and early in April, it's probably a good idea that we start recording in April. Um, and not May as prescribed by the by the BDS. So, and I'm going to skip through the next slide because I have got a bit in there. Now, a little bit more that's relevant for next time is before I'm going to hand over to John. Um, it's just to say that that damselflies, once we once we go from there, they break down into families. Um, and, uh, and what's really relevant is starting to recognise the silhouette of things. A bit like that old thing when you used to, uh, nobody here did, but anyway, when you, <laughs> you go out and look for, look for the bombers and the planes that are going past, you just look up at the silhouettes and, um, and, uh, and just recognise them. So, um, so we're going to go much more into the details of families and so forth later on. So we will try and avoid some of these long words like kinagridae. Um, so we'll try and avoid those kind of words. And, uh, and the next one is totally unpronounceable. What? Platignemitididae? Yeah. Which means it's flat. And it actually refers to the fact that that particular butterfly, the white legged damselfly, has got bingo wings. Yeah. So, and that's, so that's where the name comes from, platignemitae. So, uh, so we've got, um, we then got, we then go on to the dragon <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and then we've got various types of dragon spice in there. It's, uh, and uh, I'll just quickly, quickly with that because this is detail for next time if you come back. Hopefully you do. So, so we are going to keep it as simple as we possibly can. So one thing that we're going to need to do, that is a very beautiful, mm. beautiful uh, dragonfly that was the joy to see with the old last year, golden ring. So, what's next? Identification talk. Um, this is where we're going to start going into a little things in a little bit more detail. Um, and it's going to be again based in here. Um, and, uh, uh, then we then we need another one, which is by the, by this time Sunday fifth of May. Well, it'll be partly in here and partly actually out in the field. And this is where species where uh, John and Dion. I'll step back on this one. This is where John and Dion will start to talk about about species that can be confused with each other and tenorals. Tenorals is the term for a, for a dragonfly that has newly emerged. Bright and shiny, so, uh, bright and shiny ring, wings, but uh, but very indistinct in its colour. So you don't get the identification features. Sometimes we then have um, some of them that uh, the females in particular display much more much more vari variation in their appearance. And following on from that, we want to do much more some netting and trapping, netting more than trapping where we will look at the look at the nymphs and John has brought along some dragonfly and, dam and damselfly nymphs for you to see today there are in the sandwich box over there so, they didn't eat them in the far east 
Yeah, yeah, they are a delicacy. Yeah, yeah. yeah, like on a skewer, you know. Yeah, we're going to have for grasshoppers and dragonfly hot pot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not a hot spot. So, when we come on to doing to doing this sort of thing, looking at the anatomy, we're going to keep the language as simple as we can. So, I've chopped that insect into those three component bits. Um, and, uh, that's what insect means. It's actually insection. So, so each of those will have then features that we need to look at, and uh, things like the eye spots, um, where the hell is the pronotum? Um, it's basically that bit. Mm. And that's very important in terms of identification. Then it's got some stripes down the side here, some go faster stripes. Um, and then there's particular parts of the abdomen that you need to look at. Um, so we're going to be pointing all of these out to you. And, um, and if you can't tell that that's the front wing and that's the back wing, well, come on. Um, it's, uh, then there's the wing spots um, on there. So those are the features that you're going to look at for dams and flies. And we've got a similar list of features to look at for dragonflies as well. We've been busy. We're busy last year getting some field notes sorted out. So these are ones that we've drawn up ourselves, and um, and you'll be be uh, getting copies of these, PDF copies of these, um, and the uh, they are to help to identify what's there. But I think um, I think somebody had one of these FSC sheets, Field Study Council sheets, um, and we've got a load of those which also help. Sometimes they cause a bit of confusion because. The, because they cover species that we're not going to see in public. So, okay, almost there. So the interesting bits are coming up, but at this stage, any questions? Right. <laughs> the talk on the 17th of March, um, would it be put online or anything like that? Yes. I could yes. Can't make that one. Okay, well, this one is actually out online as well. Mm -hmm. um, we've got one one uh, participant online at the moment. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, so we can watch it at a later date, can we? We are also recording these. Recording. Yeah. So if we don't like what the recording is, we'll sit down and do it again. I, I think I mentioned on, um, over the phone that I've, I've been recording up at Pretty Mineries for um, quite a number of years, well over 20 years, but I'm running out of volunteers and uh, my eyes aren't as good as they used to be. So so if, if anyone's interested in Downy Emerald and um, mainly butterflies that I'm recording up there, but certainly there's some wonderful dragonflies and, and things like harvest mice. So there's a whole range of interests up at that tri triple SI. So that? it's beautiful. Um, that, that's, that, it's um, pretty minor, is it? Um, it, The SSSI is pretty yeah. cool. Mm -hmm. But uh, well, if, I live in Cheddar, so it's not far. Well, if, if, you get, right. if you give your name to Fred, and maybe we can arrange a get together. It is very beautiful for butterflies, mm -hmm. and it is stunning for, stunning for the dragon and damsel flies. It also has a large marsh grasshopper. <laughs> so it's a, it's a wonderful sight. Can I just say, with the Sundays, I go to church, so if you're going to keep having training sessions on a Sunday, it's going to be a problem. Okay. But I mean, obviously, Sorry. you know, it is what it is. But yeah, but we are record. They they are available on on, yeah. on Zoom and by uh, and we are recording them to put them there. To put them there. I can I can play hooky sometimes, but I'll have my ups and downs with it. Never the tablet headphones. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm just wondering what's the average life that they're on the wing for? So the overlap mm -hmm. of um, two, two identifying mm -hmm. species, mm -hmm. say in mm -hmm. April, mm -hmm. do they stay on uh, the wing? Yeah, that's well? good. Good point. And this is really why it's a good idea to monitor to monitor monthly more than the rather than three times three times a year because otherwise if you start in June you may have missed all of the or some some other ones that are coming through. So so yes, it's a very good point. And it's a great reason in general why monthly recording. I don't want to press people to go weekly. Certainly don't want to, there's no need to do that. 
um, but monthly is a good, is a good is period. Is there a average time that they're in flight or flight? So, not being any, I know, because I know nothing about these, these insects, um, I'm going to, I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask John or John or Dion to, um, to, to answer that question. A typical lifespan of an adult. Well, you could say that. Yeah, a couple of months. If, it, if, it's, if, it's, if it's an emperor, if, it, if it's a damsel fly, three weeks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so it depends on the predation. Yeah, predation. Mm -hmm. And the wings get battled around. That's, a, that's another These dragonflies, when they, when they emerge, they emerge either in the early morning or late at night. And uh, they're very fragile. The reason for them to emerge earlier dates because they don't get predated so often. But if you, they emerge when it's raining, the rain gets on the wing, it will damage the wing, and that's it. They, they don't go anywhere. Thank you. Any other? Right, it gets, it gets better <coughs> from here because I'm going to hand over now to John. It's, um, on mass like you have. It's good to see so many people turn up that are interested in dragonflies and damselflies. Um, I'm just going to really be going over the basics today, um, identification and the species that um, live in this particular area. Because there are 47 breeding species now in this country, but they don't all breed in the West Country. So we're just going to be dealing with the ones pretty much in the West Country. So to start with, we'll just talk about the difference between dragonflies and damselflies. As Fred said earlier, dragonflies come under the order Odonata, which in Greek means toothed one. And that's mainly to do with the fact that they are carnivorous insects and they use mandibles to chomp up their food. So they've got quite heavy duty mandibles if you if you, if you see them in the flesh. Um, now, the, the, the order Odonata is separated into what's known as true dragonflies and damselflies. True dragonflies are Anisoptera and damselflies are Zygoptera. That's the two suborders. Now the difference between them is that true dragonflies are a much more robust insect, a much bigger insect. <coughs> the head, the thorax, the abdomen, much, much larger than the damselfly, as you can see here. True dragonflies pretty much all rest with their wings out like that. As an aircraft would so there you, when you see a, an insect with its wings out at 45 that's a true dragonfly damsel flies with the exception of one um one one lot of them the emerald ones rest with their wings folded across their backs like that so and they're much much more daintier smaller insects um dragonflies also have true dragonflies also have very large compound eyes that pretty much in every species round here will meet together. There's only one species in this country where they don't do that, but you won't find them here in the West Country. Damselflies' eyes are out, like if you imagine a dumbbell, they're out, their eyes are out at the side like that. So they're, they still have compound eyes, but they're much smaller and they're to the sides of their head like that. If we move on. There are, there, that's a little bit out of date now. There's approximately 6,207, I found out the other day, species that they've now found worldwide. Most of them are in the tropics. We only have a very small amount of dragonflies in this country, in the Northern Hemisphere. It was mainly to do with the Ice Age, which pretty much pushed everything down south. Dragonflies have been on the planet for a long time and they're very good at adapting to what happens. So during the Ice Age, most dragonfly species went south or east. As the ice receded, several species gradually made their way further north again. As they're still trying to do now with global warming, we're still getting migrant species making their way over to this country. So there's, there's over 6,000 species that have been documented now. Approximately 126 in Europe, and there's 47 that have breeded uh, sorry, of bread, really, something mm -hmm. English, it? Of, bread in this, of, of bread in this country. Right. I think I've covered that. The um, dragonfly, as I say, is a large, robust insect with its wings held out like that. 
and the dams will fly a much more danger insect, a small insect. I'm going to skip through this a bit because we're going to be doing the identification on another talk. I'm going to go up close and personal with every single species, male and female, tenor, everything, larva, if people are interested in going that deep with stuff, on another talk. Today I've been told I've got to keep it quite simple, just, just the basics really for you. If anybody wants to ask me any questions at the end of the day about anything specific on any, any species of dragonfly or damselfly, anything they want to know, by all means come and have a chat with me about anything they, that you want to talk about. You'll be seeing these at a later date. Right, I'll talk about um, the families of um, dragonflies and damselflies now. In this country, we have five families of dragonflies and four families of damselflies. Not all of those families, again, exist in the West Country. We have um, one of the larger families, the Conagrinidae, they include the large red damselfly, and the large red damselfly is the very first damselfly that will emerge at the beginning of the year, probably the first one that you'll see. I've seen these mid-April, I haven't seen any before mid-April, but I'm sure Dion may have seen some before mid-April, because I haven't been monitoring around here as long as Dion has, so I haven't, I've seen them from about mid-April onwards. So the large red damselfly is probably the first damselfly that you will see. And they are all over this area, down at Ham Wall, you will find them, and most, most of the reserves around here. So the large, it's a, it, is, it is a large, large insect. The female, there are three different female forms of that particular damselfly, but I'm not going to go into that today. Just to say that you'll probably only see mainly the male ones. If you see the male with another one in cop, it will be the female. You will know then it is a female. But there are three different female colour forms, um, which I will go into on another day. The, um, I'll, I'll stick with the um, damselflies at the moment. The, what's known as the bluets or the blue damselflies, um, we've got a few of those in this area. We have the common blue damselfly, the azure damselfly, and the variable damselfly. The white leg damselfly is blue, but very light blue and not always blue, so I won't mention that at the moment. So we're just going to mention the, these three blues. There's um, the common blue damselfly, is a quite a large one and it is very blue. It's very hard not to distinguish it from the others. The azure damselfly is very similar to the variable damselfly and the only way that you can really tell them apart are through them through markings on their thorax or their pronotum as Fred mentioned earlier. The pronotum is a good place to actually um, decide what, what species you're looking at. Um, as a kid, when I first got into dragonflies and damselflies, I used to catch them en masse. I, mean, I, didn't, I, didn't, you know, I didn't think anything about sort of preserving them then, because when you're like seven and eight, you just catch them with a net and look at them. But we used to look at um, damselflies up close and personal, and you could literally look at them and see the difference. We only sat, I couldn't even afford a, um, a hand lens or anything like that. We used to look at them and try and see what the differences were like that. And um, you literally can, if you get close enough to a bluet, one of the blue ones, the azures or the um, variables, you can actually see the edges of the pronotums. So it's not very much to learn, really, the actual shape of the pronotum. Um, there are charts which will show you what that is. But um, the variable can look very much like the azure. Um, another giveaway is its anti-humeral stripes. There are stripes, I won't get too in detail about that, but there are stripes on the top of its thorax. Um, I need a pointer, really. Um, which are called anti-humeral stripes. In, in an azure, they're not broken, but in a variable, they can sometimes be broken. Pretty much always they're broken, except in the female one, which creates another <laughs> identification problem there. So there's an example of the common blue. That's a very blue one. There's the azure. 
Forget the snooker player, that's just something that the Dragonfly Society use. I don't particularly go to use that myself. Um, it's what they've got, a, they've got a little stripe on their thorax which gives them away, um, which that one doesn't have. They, on their thorax, they have indentations called sutures, which are how the thorax moves. They're kind of lines in there, and that's what these stripes move on. There, there's a variable one. I mentioned the broken antihumeral stripe. You can see it on that one there. This is the stripe I'm talking about. This blue line here, mm. and it continues up the end there, but it's gone there. It's missing there. So you can see it's broken. On, on the azure, that will be completely through there as a blue line. The white-legged damselfly, they've got what they call expanded tibia. The tibia is the second, they've got three sections to their legs. They've got the femur, the tibia, and the tibia is the, the second one down. If you look on that picture, you can see the white expansion on there, and that's what gives them their name. Even their larva have got expanded legs on the larva as well. So when you catch the larva, you can tell it's the white-legged one because of it's got, it follows through all the same thing. But they're, they're quite easy to um, determine, really. Um, when they first emerge, they're all pink. As a tenoral, they're pink. Then they go a white colour, very grey white colour. And they've got double black white lines, uh, sorry, black lines on their abdomen. The male will take on blue, a blue coloration. Mm. So as, it, as they mature, the male, of that takes on a slight bluish coloration. So it begins to look a bit like a bluet from a distance until you see those expanded tibia on there, until you see those expanded legs, and then you notice the white leg on them. Um, the, there are some that don't go blue. So we've got that one in a minute. There are some that don't turn blue, and that's to do with humidity. If it's a very humid time, of the month when they emerge, they will remain white and they will not have the black lines on their abdomen. They will just have black spots on the abdomen. And that's to do with humidity. Down in Kent, I've, I've seen some down there, where they've got no black lines on them at all and they just remain white and they don't go blue at all. The male doesn't go blue. And that's called lactia. La this is the blue-tailed damselfly. This is one of my, my favourites because you're likely to see this one on an overcast day. So it's not always sunny weather that you will see them in. Primarily it is. But the blue tail will be out in overcast conditions as well. So, um, and, in, and a bit of wind. If there's a bit of wind, it will still be around. And they can tolerate brackish water as well, the blue tail down the fly. Now, it's obviously called the blue-tailed damselfly because of it, the blue here. <laughs> but there is another one which we'll come across called the red-eyed, large red-eyed damselfly that also has a blue tail. <laughs> but its blue tail is right to the end on the large red-eyed, whereas this one, it only goes on eight and nine. Yeah, eight and nine. They've got ten segments to their abdomen. 10 segments, and when you say numbers eight and nine, that means the segments of the abdomen. So when we come to the red-eyed damselfly, the large red-eyed, you'll notice it's got to be blue all the way down, whereas the blue tail just goes, it's mainly blue there, and that's saying with a bit of black at the end here. They're quite easy to distinguish, really. They haven't got red eyes either. So, um, well, they have slightly, they can have slightly. The thing is, with dragonflies and damselflies, now I've travelled around a lot in this country and other countries, Europe as well, all over Europe, which is where the same insects exist. And they do change colour very slightly in different places. You can have slightly different colour forms. You think, is this a different species? Is it? And it's not, generally. It, it's usually the same. It can get confusing in this country because this particular one has five female forms. I, th I think it's got six female forms myself, but they say in the book five, um, which can be confusing for people as well. But that I will talk to people on that another day. 
or if they want to know anything about it today, just come and ask me. But there are five female forms, but the majority that you see will be the um, blue one. Sorry, it's a good mind of its own. There we go, thank you again. They're one of my favourite. They come under the genus Ishnura. I won't, I won't go too much into this. I won't go too much into this. But they come under the genus Ishnura. And there, there's, a, there's a damsel fly called the citrine forktail. This has got nothing to do with the West Country. But the citrine forktail is the only member of the Odonata that uses parthenogenesis. It breeds in America and it breeds in other parts of the world, and it uses male and female. On the Azores, there's a huge population of the citrine forktail, that when it um, oviposits, they're all females, and when they lay their eggs, they're all females. And they lay their eggs again, and they're all females. Apart from the genesis, they don't need a male. It's the only dragonfly, it's the only member of Odenar that does that, just a snippet of fun for you there for a minute. but they are closely related they come under the Ishnura genus they're the same genus as the this is the red-eyed one that I mentioned prior to the last one as you can see its eyes they're not bright red but they're red enough to see as being a dark red color but you can see the blue tail extends pretty much to the end on that one they like resting on lily pads. There's some, there's some drains along here full of lily pads in the summer and you will see these species literally on a sunny day just lying on the lily pads and coming up. So that's a good place to spot them. Is that called the south drain of the north? Yes. The, south south drain. Drain. the south drain up there is a good place to see those if you want to spot those. The emerald. I wouldn't say that is as prolific around here as the others, um, but it, it likes standing water pretty much, well-vegetated ponds. There's a place not far from here called Cartgate, where we've seen it, and it exists there, and it does exist in a few other ponds. It is over at Sturt Marshes, in a couple of the ponds there, that they've got over there. And um, I don't know anywhere in this immediate area that that one exists. Am I wrong in that, saying that? Has anyone seen no. it here? I've never seen it in a pond here in this area, but it is, it could, could get here, it could come into this part of the country quite easily. But the emerald damselfly, you'll always know an emerald damselfly. They, they come under the um, genus Lestis, and um, they're the only damselfly that breast with their wings out like that. Not as, not as, flat as, as a dragonfly does, but the wings are always apart like that. They're never closed across their back. And that, that's the emerald. And they're the only, they're the only down to fly, or the, this particular one, the emerald, as opposed to, the, there's another one called the scarce emerald, which we won't find here. But the emerald gets pruinescence on it as well. Pruinescence is a slight waxy bloom, a blue waxy bloom. If you can see it just on the, just behind the thorax there, on the pronotum and on its tail. That's a waxy bloom that it gets on it called prunescence as it gets older and older. It's the only, it's the only damsel fly that will have that prunescence on it. So if you see one like that, that's green, got a green thorax, green abdomen, wings are spread out with a bit of prunescence, that's guaranteed emerald. But they like standing water with a lot of emergent vegetation and they gently fly around in amongst it and they disappear, right. don't they? But um, you, you mentioned not recorded locally. I, yeah. I've never recorded up at Pretty, but Dr. Parr, who was recording there before me, recorded the, the Emerald Dams Apply there. In Pretty? Yeah. In, in Pretty, yeah. Oh, cool. So there we go. So anyone wants to go to Pretty, a good place as well. John, the other thing about those are the uh, late emergence. The late emergence. The late emergence. Late, oh, the late emergence. Yeah, they, they, they're not an early emergence, though. They come out much later in the year. Than a lot of the other damsel flies so they're um they're not for example you're not going to see it when you see the large red it's well over july i would say isn't yes. it it's the end of july that you will see those so you won't you, you pretty much wouldn't find one before that time but as we as they were saying earlier a lot of these adults only live maybe two weeks if they're lucky and that's if they're really lucky maybe six if they're super lucky when they don't get predated upon they spiders likely, I mean they get caught in spiders webs, 
birds get them, everything gets them. Dragonflies. Dra out of the dragonflies, yeah. <laughs> Even large damselflies will take a small damselfly. It's just like that happening. Crickets. Yeah. <laughs> then we have the demoiselle, which is the largest um, damselfly that we have in this area. The banded demoiselle is probably, I'd say, it's a bit more common than the beautiful demoiselle. Um, even though both exist, um, the banded demoiselle, you tend to find that with the white legged damselfly as well, where the white legged one is, because the white legged one tends to like flowing water, streamy water, and so does the banded demoiselle. So wherever it's a little bit flowy, you're going to find that. You're not going to find that necessarily in a, in a pond necessarily, but um, primarily flowing water that, that, that particular species. Um, they're the only, um, they're, I didn't mention the wing spots, Fred mentioned this, but all dragonflies and damselflies have spots on the ends of their wings known as pterostigma, um, which are like a balancing device. They're, they're a cell on, on the ends of the wings, are darker in colour. The, the, dam, the um, demoiselles don't have one, the males don't have one, but the females have a spot called a pseudo pterostigma, which is um, a white mark, a slight white mark on the ends of their wings. They're the only ones that don't have that. But they have incredible, <coughs> the word is called venation for the wing, a beautiful wing venation on these. Why are they called damsel, d demoiselle? Well, it's French, French really, <laughs> for beautiful, dainty damsel. Yeah. They were all called um, Demoiselle. If you go back to the history of recording dam dragonflies, um, there was a guy called um, Salis Longchamps. He's one of the first people to record, record them. And they were all pretty much called Demoiselles. And they're all, all, all of them, all, all of the, um, all of the um, damselflies, not, not just these. Things have changed. The names of them have changed over the years, really. Um, from when they were first um, first recorded, when people first started recording, they've, they've changed quite quite a bit, and they're still changing now. There's a few here um, that have uh, got particular names that are changing all along. The um, the banded demoiselle is a an obvious one to tell on the male. You can see the band on the wing there, the dark band on the wing. The beautiful demoiselle, the wing is pretty much the same colour, and the, the, these two here are males. The females again have slightly different wing colours, mm. um, but they look they look very similar. You get yeah, both are. of those on the cheddar yellow as well, just in general. Yeah, on the yellow, yeah, yeah, just down the yeah. yeah. yeah on, on the rivers there. Yeah, yeah they, they like all that kind of any, anything that's moving water. These prefer cleaner, fresher, streamier water than they do, because the banded demoiselle will actually over deposit in a lake as well, which has been seen. Going back to the white-legged damselfly, I did say that pretty much likes flowing water, but it's the only one of its genus, and there's six, there are six um, of, in the genus of the white-legged damselfly, there's six in, in Europe, but it's the only one here that will breed in standing water now. It's been recorded breeding in standing water, so you will find the white leg in standing water, but primarily in flowing water. How do you tell the females apart in those two? Well, the female, they've got different colour wings. So, no, um, how do you tell the female banded from the female beautiful? They've got different colour wings. So on the really? on, on the banded them on the banded <coughs> themselves, it's got greenish wings. Yeah. And this one's got brownish wings. Yeah. So this if you look at if, if you look at the female, they've got the female of this has got a browny looking wing with a white splosh here known as a pseudo pterostigma um, and that, that's got green, more greener wings with a white splosh in a slightly different position. Is it it was the banded? position of the pterostigma I was, I, yeah, thought, that, that, I thought was the best way. It is a good way of doing it, it is, it is in a slightly different position but I just do it by the colour really because it is yeah. quite noticeable, do you say that? Yeah. yeah. Is the female banded banded or is it just got... No, it's the same. Right. Yeah. Sometimes the banded male can extend its band almost to the tip. Mm -hmm. And that can throw people, they think they found something a little bit different, but there are, 
there are versions like that, but, but the majority <coughs> of the ones you'll see will just have an obvious band like that. I don't go into too many things because we could be a half hour on one specific. <laughs> yeah. Let me move on. Right, we'll move on to the. Um, I haven't. I haven't mentioned the. It's not on here. I haven't mentioned the small red-eyed dandelion fly, and um, the um, small red, the red, small red either. Have we seen the small red here? Yes. Yeah. Oh, that is small red. Small but red eyes. Small red eyes. Yeah. yeah. Small reds, yeah. mate. Yeah, it's a small red. Small eye. reds, yeah. much more of a heat from the thing. Yeah, it's a heat, definitely, yeah. definitely, yeah. So it's, it's basically the small red eye. That apparently, that's been seen as well. And the small red eyed um, damsel fly is a lot, um, it's pretty much like the red eyed damsel fly, but um, the eyes are a lot redder. Yeah. I get red damsel flies in the garden, so what would they be? Red ones? Yeah. Large Probably red. Large red. red. Yeah, pretty much. It's a red one, pretty much the large red, yeah. Sorry. So, these aren't in a particular order, but I will ex I'll just go through them. The southern hawker is quite common around here, and um, they're, they're one of my favourites, actually. They're a very, very inquisitive dragonfly. Um, they'll actually come right up to you. And, and look and, and investigate human beings. They're not at all scared of you. They'll come and investigate you all the time. <coughs> they actually like, we've actually found out that they like fans. If you, the little fans that you buy in the summer that have got a little battery in them, they've just got little plastic um, rotors on them. If you do it on a slow motion and you hold it, they will investigate the fan. <laughs> I've proven this, I've got lots of proof. If you hold the fan out, they'll come and have a look at it. And, Maybe thinking it's another one of their species, I'm not sure, but they do like it. But don't get it too close, you don't want to hit it with the fan. <laughs> <laughs> it really would do a lot of good, probably bits of dragonfly everywhere. But um, that, they, they are a very, very inquisitive, um, inquisitive dragonfly, the southern hawker. And they're a very, very large insect, very large insect, not the largest, but a very large one nonetheless. And they're known as mosaic hawkers because of the patterning on their abdomen. You can, this is how you can pretty much tell them. I'll, I'll be going into this when we do the identification on them, about the different mm. patterns on them. They have large headlights. They have extremely large headlights, yeah. don't they? Yeah, large headlights. There's always something, there's, always, there's, there's lots of little, little features. And I find that <clears> different <throat> people pinpoint different things that, that helps them. It's whatever helps you to identify the species. There are lots of ways you can identify a species. And it's sometimes worth just thinking of one or two things and not worrying about too much because otherwise it just becomes just too much. And when you see things in the field out there, they're always slightly different to what they are when you see them on a picture. Not, not greatly, but um, in the flesh, things can sometimes be a little bit not, you know, a little bit more difficult to ascertain what it actually is. If you flick between those two, the headlights works really well, doesn't it? Yeah, the headlights. So so if you look down here, the bands on the southern hawk at the bottom join together. The markings going down the abdomen are separated. You can see the separate markings there. But at the bottom, they're like bands. So that's the headlights. So no. Oh, we've got, oh, 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 you're talking about? Yeah. Oh, you're talking about the ones on the, yeah. the, the anti-humeral yeah, ones? Yeah, anti those headlights. Yeah, you're talking those headlights. Because I always use that. To, so I'm getting middle up and I'm getting muddled up with tail lights. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, tail lights. The ones on the end, are known as tail lights, and the headlights are the anti-humerals on the top of the thorax there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there we go. Neither on their heads. Sorry, no, they're not on their head. No, they haven't got headlights on their, their head. No. They've just got the large compound eyes. Large compound eyes there. You can see the wonderful wing venation on those. These are known as the most um, the um, the Asianids. As that's the. Um, Will they come under? They're, they're the most ancient form of dragonfly, really. And um, they've always got, the male ones have always got angled hind wings. If you look at their hind wings, the male ones have got an angle at the, on their hind wings. Mm. Whereas they've got things called oracles that come off of their off their body where they connect with the female, which so you can bash into them in flight. So there we go. There's a southern hawker. 
then that one's got side lights. Yeah, that one's got side lights. Yeah, we can set we we'll side lights. They're this. not yeah. if you they're not as big on that one, are they? <laughs> we will go into this in yeah. detail when it comes to the next bit that on the identification yeah. bit, but we don't want to get too bogged down. No, we won't get too bogged down with it now. But the migrant hawker is one that you see a, a lot here. There's lots yeah. and lots of those, and they're they're towards the end of the year as well. They're, you'll get them. They go into even into November, don't they? Yeah. They yeah. even go into November if it's mild enough for them. Hawker. It's not a small one either, but it's probably like that. Whereas the other one, the southern one's a bit bigger than that. So that's one of ours. The hairy dragonfly, that's the first one that you'll see emerge. The hairy dragonflies. I've seen those in at the end of at the end of March, April around here. Pam Wall was a place that I saw them um, last year. There were lots and lots of those around there. Um, they're very, very easy to um, identify really. Again, they've got headlights on them on the top. The female doesn't have it. The, the female's headlights are much more reduced than that, but um, the male's got big headlights. Um, they've got a very hairy thorax, hence the name. The female's got a hairy abdomen as well. The, the hair extends down the abdomen on the female. And that's the very first one that you'll see. It's quite a, it's quite a small one. And it's, um, its abdomen isn't as pinched in as some of the others. It's um, it's a, got a much straighter abdomen. There's the golden ring. That's one of my favourites, which Dion introduced me to actually this year around here. There's um, a place called Carpate we went to. It's a bit far off, but we found quite a few of them there. But apparently they do exist in this area as well. They are in. They do. They do like flowing water. The uh, golden. I get them in my garden are they yeah then, well the female is oh, there yeah the female is the largest one is our longest one it's, in bulk it's not the largest but it's the longest one because it has a very long ovipositor that one's a male one you can tell that by its um angled hind wings in fact it's only got a very short anal appendage the great anal appendages on the end there they're like pogo sticks when they're actually going along in the river laying over depositing their eggs. They've got a very long, um, well, it's called a vulva scale. They don't have an over depositor like, uh, it's only, only, only the damselflies and the aeshnids, which are all the hawkers um, and, and the emperor, they're the only ones that will lay their eggs in vegetation. All the others just deposit them. But this one's a bit of a halfway house. It does actually dip its eggs into the mud at the bottom of the stream with its, um, it's called a vulva scale. It's a scale where the eggs just drop out at the bottom of it like that. It hasn't got a, like a serrated um, knife edge that it can actually dig into a plant and insert its eggs. So that's the golden ring. There's the emperor. The emperor is our largest um, dragonfly, um, Anax Imperator. I have to say that, just like, just yeah, like it's that. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's just a wonderful one. The, the male is, um, is blue like that. It's got a blue abdomen, the female's green. But saying that, some of the females can be blue as well. But so if you see one on, on vegetation, on a lily, over positing on a lily, and it's slightly blue, it's curved, it's curved around, it's over positing, and it is blue, it's definitely a female. But most of them are green. So that's our emperor. That's one of the, that's a very widespread dragonfly worldwide. It was pretty much down in, it's right down in Africa. If you go to Africa, you can find it all over Africa, all over Europe, to the Far East. It's very, 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 very widespread. And it's, um, it's colonized here fantastically. It's one of my favorites, the emperor. Um, so much so that I, I, I literally, I breed these myself and I, I brought a couple along to show you today not as an adult, but as a final instar larva, ready to emerge this year. Uh, I've got a male and a female. You can tell the difference between the larva, but I won't go into how you do that. But I've got a male and a female here, which if anybody's interested, you can have a look at. Um, I've also got, I've also bought an azure damselfly larva, which I also breed, um, to show you the size difference between the larva, the largest and probably one of the smaller ones. So you can see the difference between them and how to identify them. But um, these are really interesting. I will just have two minutes on this, just two minutes on this very because I think you'll find this quite interesting. 
They do what's called synchronised emergence, and so do quite a few other dragonflies. Synchronised emergence means they all emerge at exactly the same time, and they all emerge in the night time. Now, I've only seen this twice in 50 years, but I want to see it again this year, and I'm going to take some people out to try and find this. What happens is, and I only know this because of living near ponds where I've watched them quite closely, on synchronised emergence, they all, all the lava on a particular evening will make their way to the edge of the pond and they'll put their heads out mm -hmm. and they'll put their thorax out and they then, they've got spiracles in the thorax, they start to breathe air from the outside world. So they sit there like that. The sun goes down, it gets to about half past 10, 11, they crawl up the emergent vegetation all at the same time, they all start going up en masse. And there's a place here where they do this. They all come up on mass, and they literally do what they do. They emerge because they go through what's called um, they go get, when they emerge. They go they, they emerge as a lava, and they they come out. It probably takes, I would say, it varies really. Sometimes twenty minutes to two hours to do it. But they all emerge at the same time. Some of them will actually climb. On, I've seen this where they climb up, that's the lava, they climb up and another one climbs on top of it. And so the one underneath can't emerge and it literally dies. It does that. That's it. It can't even try it, it can't. So the one on top will emerge successfully, um, but the ones underneath won't. So they'll all be doing this and they'll all emerge by about one o'clock in the morning and they'll all sit there and they're, all, they're in their what they call tenoral state, which is a glassy looking insect, very glassy wings, very nowhere near looking at this colour. The colours are very, very pale. And they, they'll all do that. Now, some of the interesting things that happen, if it rains or the weather changes overnight, a lot of those dragonflies will get bashed and battered. Those wings will get demolished. But some of the larvae that have come up and haven't emerged, once they detect this, they literally go back down again and they go back just into the water and they'll wait till the next night and do it again. So some will save themselves like that. So you'll get a lot get damaged. It doesn't always happen. Most of them get away successfully. But if you were to go there at 4.30 in the morning, they will all be gone. That's for predation purposes. They will disappear before the birds get up and on mass to start coming. I was when I was at West Hay last year, the sun dunes, um, must have been about June, there were piles and piles of wings like this um, down by the sun dews. Yeah. And I just, no bodies, no bodies at all or heads. No, well, and I just wondered how they got there. But that predators would be, usually just eat the nutrients. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they yeah. lose the wings. Dragonflies do the same thing. When a dragonfly catches yeah. a butterfly, it drops the wings off. But they would have all come out at once, wouldn't they? Like they, you were saying, no. because there were so many of them. Yeah. Yeah. So what I'm telling you here, it's not just the emperor, it, it, synchronised emergence works for several species as well, not just the emperor, I won't go into all the species, but it does work for lots of species. But it's a wonderful thing to see, and if you're there at about two in the morning, if anyone wants to come out with me this year, I'm going to be doing this, they all start wing whirring, and it's a fantastic sound to hear them generate the um, temperatures in their thorax, so that they can do that maiden flight because they need to do that maiden flight before it gets light, before the pred predators come around to take their toll on them, really. But the strangest thing is, you'll see 150, 170 go off, but later on in the month, you'll only see eight or nine or 10 of them coming back to the, around the area. So if you're monitoring them sometimes, you think, well, they, they, they're here, but there's only that amount, and you didn't realize there was hundreds of them but that's the only time exuvia can tell you where success, there's a lot of success with them um, breeding in a particular place where you get the lava cases. If you pick up the exuvia, you see there's loads, loads of exuvia here. You've obviously had a mass emergence at this point. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be doing that um, this year. I've mentioned it to Fred about taking people out to what, try and do a mass emergence. I do a little bit of home. Predators take their toll and they go on and... They take, take them about two weeks to be sexually mature, um, a hawker or a large dragonfly, approximately two weeks. They disappear from the water's edge. They go away. They go into woodland, grant rides. They go all over, over fields, vegetation, hunting for insects. Some of them disperse. Some of them will come back to where they came, where they bred from. 
and continue to do the same thing for the next year there as well. The other wonderful thing about the emperor is it's, it's the, one of the only dragonflies that in this country, in exactly the same place, that it does a one year cycle or a two year cycle. Some of them are do a one year and some of them are do a two year. What is that? Univoltine or bivoltine. Is that it? No, it's lava. Oh. Yeah, because in, in a larval stage, the emperor will either do it in a year or it'll do it in two years in exactly the same place. And there's a reason for that, which is on the next instalment when you come along. <laughs> <laughs> the common data, that's very common around here, very, very common dragonfly. Another one that um, emerges slightly later in the year and goes on till November, very late. Another, another very inquisitive insect is one of, the, one, one of the dragonflies that likes light surfaces, really. So you can literally get them to land on your arms and your face and your head, and you can, they'll come and sit on you. You can study them up real close there like that. So that's the common data. Force body chaser that we just mentioned, uh, another one from mass emergence. There were loads of those here this year, loads of force body chasers. Broad body chaser, another common one. We're doing males and females. The males are the blue ones, the prunescent. <laughs> the scarce chaser, which is, they're thinking of renaming that the blue chaser now. I don't know why, because the, the female only slightly may go blue if it's extremely old. But other than that, it won't, but the male will. John. You, you can see on the male. The, the, the male emerges as a brown. Yeah. As a brown dragon. <coughs> Yeah. Just change to a blue as it goes as it gets older, yeah. yeah so, the, both of those uh scarce chasers look the same. I always call these bell, <coughs> bell shapes on here, like they look like bells, yeah. to me. and um, they both got those when they first emerged. They both look like that, they've got an orangey color with a black bell mm -hmm. on them, like that. You can see on that one there, the pruinescent on it, which is the blue, is slightly smudged, and you can tell that one's been mating yeah. because that's where the female comes mm -hmm. in remove some of the pruinescence from it as well. black tail skimmer, that's quite common around here as well, isn't yeah, it? That's yeah. Very, very, very common. That's another one that has pruinescence. Um, skimmers, unlike the um, chasers, don't, you can tell they've got clear wings, pretty, pretty much their wings, that's a diagnostic feature, the fact that their wings are pretty clear right down to where they join the wing muscles, whereas the chasers tend to have dark yeah, markings exactly. down at the bottom, so some people get the chasers slightly muddled up with those, but they tend to, they tend to settle on the ground as well quite a lot, so you'll be walking along and there'll be one literally in front of you on the ground like that and he'll take off and do his own back down on the ground again like that. But they don't hang, they're not hangers really, like the um, the Asian eggs, like hawkers. And that's that's the end of that. Go back to that in a second. So, pretty much in this area, we've got um, several um, families of damselflies. We've, we've got um, the ones that cover all the blues, the reds. The red eyes they all come under the same, they all come under the same family, those ones. And then we've got the emerald, and we've got the white legged. And that's for the white legged a separate one. It doesn't come under the same same family as the um, as the blues. Um, and with the dragonflies, we've got the um, the hawkers um, and the emperor. They're all they're all pretty much under the same. Same umbrella there. We've got the golden ring, which is a different one. Have we got the vagrant emperor here? I haven't seen the vagrant emperor, but I think there's there's one called the lesser emperor, which right. apparently is now breeding successfully. This is there, there are a few coming in here breeding successfully. Dion knows a little bit about the. Yeah. So if you do, you, do you want to mention that? Well, um, Andrew Kirby, who's a more photographer down here, uh, showed me a photographed some dragonflies about a month ago and they're he found they were deposited eggs on West Haven. Mm -hmm. and they also had a, a a marsh harrier eating one. So 
they are definitely breeding down there. Another another one you you will find with darters is a red is a red vein darter. There's quite a few of them around as well. Mm -hmm. So it's well worth when you see your darters, is just check the lineage of the wing. If they look a bit orangey or red, then try to get a photograph of them and just enlarge and see. Um, the thing with the with the, uh, the red vein darter, the female has got yellow veins, so it's a bit. A bit more. Another, another uh, diagnostic thing with them is that the top of the eye is red, and the lower half of the eye is blue. So, um, yeah, but you will find you will find them. There's no doubt about that because they they are around. Yeah, I've seen brown horses as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Brown, 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 I've got a couple on set. They're not on the, yeah. on the thing. So, yeah. We yeah. did brown, brown, brown or because it's one of the they're in the underwater for one of the longest anything under five years. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. they're a long time. Yeah, yeah, long time. yeah a bit like it, it depends on food, what, what food is around. With. When I first came here in the mid eighties, was that brown anything? hawker? You couldn't see it no. around here. Really and not. over that time mm -hmm. they are now quite common in yeah. July. They're very yeah, common. Same same as my Van Hawker, that was another one. Yeah. My Van Hawker came in. Yeah, in recent years. Yeah, yeah. Of yeah. course, all these things are spreading across. Seven the Mark we've got now. Yeah. 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 Um, I've seen the Norfolk yeah. Hawker was so called recorded up, I think, on half more last year. Yeah, Norfolk Hawker mm -hmm. will be yeah, here issue. within the next few years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Much more commonly. Mm -hmm. And this yeah. is why we're doing this the monitor. This is why we're doing the monitoring. Yeah. But we will cover all of these species and go over it in the in more detail next yeah. yeah. month. Yeah, because <laughs> it's different. Once you start bringing all the migrant ones and that, people get a little bit confused with it. So it's probably best just to keep to the yeah. species of the hill. Like I did, I didn't mention, I didn't have a picture there of the, of the brown hawker, but the brown hawker is a very common one. It's a very large dragonfly. Very large and dragonfly brown. The other one I didn't mention was the ruddy data. Yeah. That's another data, yeah. like the common data, but much more scarlet red, red face, black legs. It's got black, black legs. legs. You can tell the difference. It's got black legs, whereas the um, common data has got dark legs with yellow stripes on them. If you look at the legs, you'll see a light yellow stripes on the legs on the common data. Um, but they're, they're very friendly insects. The ruddy the so, data as well has got a, has got a wasted body. It has. Yeah. yeah. They're all, they're all diagnostic features that you can yeah. use, aren't they? Yeah. But like I said earlier, it's probably best to get a couple of diagnostic features in your head when you're looking for things and just go with that initially. And um, if you have any problems with it, just give anybody a ring if you want to and just try and find out. Or I'll take photographs. Photographs is yeah, the best photographs way. Take photographs of everything you see. And if you're not sure what it is, then they'll give it to somebody that can identify it for you. And that's always the best way. But that, that, that pretty much sums up my talk today, I think. I, I haven't mentioned anything about how they reproduce or about their biology or anything like that, but is that good enough for the next time? Or yeah, yeah, Next you know, time is fine. Well. <laughs> I mean, so next time I'm gonna go into kind of biology, how they reproduce, different types of oviposition, different ways of where they lay their eggs, how you can how you can bring them up yourself, or how you can breed them yourself, um, study them, do whatever you want. Um, and also about the females as well, identification of females and the differences between them. I will say I do I have actually brought some exuvia with me today, which I found round here last year. So if anybody's interested in seeing what exuvia look like, I know that some of you have seen this a lot and it's, it's pretty commonplace. But if I can show you some exuvia of different species that have emerged round here, I've also actually got some living larva. So, because I bring them up myself, I've got some ponds myself where I bring up the larva. So I've got some one year cycle um, emperors, which are on their final instar now. They're ready, they're gonna, rem they won't emerge just yet. The trouble is if I keep them too warm, they might, yeah, they they might, might emerge. They will try and emerge, it's a bit sad. I don't, want to, I don't want them to come out yet. So I've got, two, I've got two emperors and I've got a couple of azure damsel flies. So you can literally see what they look like when they're in the water. And at this time of year, it's quite fun to go out looking for the um, the larva as well, and trying to identify the larva. But that's another another thing, which will take up another couple of hours to chat with you, which I would love to do. But we'll have to leave it to another time. Yeah. Is that okay? Thank you. Great. No, that's fine. No, that's fine. Excellent. Well one last thing, because there's so many of them, it's quite hard to move the larva around. 
Um, but you'll have to come like file around with me and see them if you want to come and yeah. see them. And I'll show, I can show, maybe show you the jet propulsion as well. 